artists and welcome back to my channel. My name is Margot Halleck and I'm a professional artist and illustrator. And I don't know if you've noticed this over the course of the past couple of videos that I've been putting out, but I have completely and utterly fallen in love with Daniel Smith watercolors. So this may come as a surprise to you if you know me as the Windsor and Newton aficionado, which I have been for my entire career. But over the past year or so, as I've dabbled more and more into the world of Daniel Smith, and I've discovered their, their very unique paints and have gotten more and more um, comfortable with them, I've really grown to appreciate the quality that they offer and how surprising and interesting their paints are. So what I did recently is I purchased this 24 pan watercolor set from them because I thought this would be a great base to take with me if I'm traveling or if I'm doing en plein air kind of painting, which is you know painting outdoors in the yard or um, taking my paints with me on the go. Um, so I want to demo a bunch of these paints for you, swatch them, and I also think that it's a terrific paint collection to start with if you are looking to level up your watercolor supplies, if you're a beginner watercolorist but you are looking to um, trade in maybe your student grade paints for something that's more professional, I think this would make a great addition to anybody's arsenal. So um, we will jump right in and I will give you my impressions on each of these colors and demo them and swatch them so you can get a sense of what to expect when you're jumping into the world of Daniel Smith. So with that said, I hope you're interested because we'll jump right in. All right, so I have the packaging right here and let's crack this open. So I see that the box ships with two palettes, one 24 pan palette um, with all the colors that are listed here in the back, as well as what appears to be an empty palette for me to fill in with whatever paints that I have from either my collection or if I wanna purchase some other colors from their series um, and customize another palette, I can do that. And the second palette has the same number of containers or, um, or wells. So there's about 24 of them in, in both of them. So here we go, we have the top one, which is the palette that I actually purchased, and then the second one below, which is the, I guess, free gift or bonus with purchase. And I'm gonna concentrate obviously on the palette that I wanted, which is the 24 pan palette. And on the back, you'll see that there is a summary of all the colors that are included in this palette, which we'll get into in a little bit. So opening up the palette, I can see that it's a really nice, very convenient size. It's actually a perfect size for uh, traveling with. Um, for myself, I can definitely easily fit this in a handbag or purse um, or a diaper bag, which I'm gonna be using very soon. And really straightforward, we have the usual overlay with all the, you know, summary of all the colors, as well as all the paint pans. And in the traditional fashion, the palette is organized by color or by sections. So we have all the warm colors on the first row. Um, so we've got the warm colors and then we get the cool, the greens and the blues, and then the earth tones towards the end of the palette. So that's fairly straightforward, nothing new here. Let's take a quick peek at what the other palette looks like um, before jumping into doing our swatches. So I'm gonna put this to the side and come back to it. And let's pop open this bonus palette, um, which if I understand correctly, should be an empty palette and I'll have the ability to fill that up if I want to, or if I want to customize it with some pans from Daniel Smith, I can do that too. So it looks identical. And when you open it up, um, it's exactly the same thing, just an empty palette. So I think that summarizes what's included in the package when you buy this palette. So let's put this empty palette, um, I guess in storage for now, because I don't think I'm gonna need it, and concentrate on the 24 pan palette with all the pre-existing colors that ship with this product. So um, yeah, let's jump right into swatching. Okay, so let's do a demo of um, what this set looks like. And I have the labeling system or the little sheet that comes with all of these paints right here. I'm gonna put it right here to the side so we have a good guide of what all these colors are as I swatch them and sort of take a quick, uh, not a quicker, but a more in-depth look at each of these colors. And we're gonna start with the buff titanium and I have a clean glass of water here that uh, I'll start with and I'll probably rinse halfway through this swatching series. So let's 
wet my brush and I have a number 10 Princeton Aqua Elite brush, which right now is my absolute favorite brush. This is my go-to and I use it so much. And I might make a video all about Princeton's lineup of brushes and this one in particular, because I picked this up recently and I just fell in love with it and the, the quality of this brush. So enough said, let's get started with the first color, which is Buff Titanium. I'm gonna keep these swatches somewhat freeform and more organic so we can see how the paint disperses and what happens with washes. So right here, the Buff Titanium is this really nice beigey, sandy color, which would be great for natural landscapes, for painting boulders, rocks, sand, literally, <laughs> or even as a base for skin tones, specifically fair skin tones. And this paper that I'm using for this sample series is Legion Aqua Hot Press, or Cold Press, Cold Press, obviously because of the texture. Um, so let me label this swatch so we have a nice idea of what it is afterwards. Buff Titanium. Okay, and now let's move on to the next color, Hansa Yellow Light. And Hansa Yellow Light is very much of a sunshine, rubber ducky, very bright and vivid primary yellow. So let's get that going. And I might just make the swatch a little bit smaller. I'm realizing that I might run out of room. If I do, I might switch to a different page, but that's okay. We'll assess the situation as we go. So very nice, very smooth transition. And if I wash my paint out and I pull that color down a little bit, you can see that it gets a little bit more subtle as you lighten that wash. I could see this on a daffodil. I could see this on florals. I could see this on a canary yellow diamond or a tutu. And you know, when you dip your paints into the pans here, you really don't need like very much at all. I'm just dipping the very, very tip of my brush, kind of like the tip of a pin. And with that, I just have way, way, way more pigment than I need. So you can really just use this very sparingly and have a ton of color. Okay, so let's wash that off and we get a paper towel and I'm gonna label this Hansa Yellow Light. Next up we have, what is this? Um, quinacridone Gold. And I love quinacridones because they have a gorgeous warmth to them and they're very, very helpful when it comes to mixing other neutral colors. So let's get this one going and yeah, kind of what I expected, which is beautiful, very jewel-like gold. And just like with the Hansa Yellow, you can see just how little pigment you need to create a very earthy, warm earth color. But as this color lightens, it becomes more and more yellow. That's probably the, the name gold. And this could be used for a, a coin. It could be used for animals, depending on what kind of animal you're, you're painting. So I could see this on birds, um, if you're into that kind of subject matter or even the brilliant golds that you find in the Hall of Mirrors of Versailles. I could easily see this color being reflected throughout. So let's label this quinacridone gold. Next we have Hansa Yellow Deep. And Hansa Yellow Deep is, um, I guess the darker brother of Hansa Yellow Light. So I'm expecting this to be a little bit more like the quinacridone gold, maybe slightly more orangey as well. So let's try that out and see what we think. So in the pan, it actually looks very orangey, like a sunflower color. So let's get that going and um, get that color right here. And yes, you definitely have like a, a coloration that you would find on the leaf of a sunflower. Very pretty color too, a nice smooth, very buttery consistency. And I'm not seeing all that much granulation on this swatch so far. Um, it's looking very even and very finely milled in terms of the actual pigment here. So this one um, is Hansa Yellow Deep, and you can see this is Hansa Yellow Light, and it's considerably lighter and more of a canary yellow than um, what we see here in the Hansa Yellow Deep, which is considerably more orange and um, doesn't have that neutral kind of undertone that you see here. It has more of a, a vivid, orange, um, kind of like the yolk of an egg. So the middle part of an egg will probably be more around this 
coloration. So let's get that labeled Hansa Yellow Deep and move on to our next color, which is Pearl Scarlet. And this I'm anticipating to be kind of a red with a bit of an orange hue to it. So let's give that a go, rinsing this off. And since we're still in the warm colors, I'm not gonna change my water just yet because it is a little bit yellowish in tint, but I think it's not gonna affect the color of my pigment all that much. <clears throat> so right away, the second you put your brush into this pan, it activates the paint immediately. You don't have to really work your brush in there so much to get the desired consistency that you want from watercolors. Um, you can just add a teeny bit of water, or if you actually wanted to pre-prep your palette ahead of time, you could use a spray bottle or even one of these um, droppers that I have and prep your palette by adding a drop to each one of these pigments beforehand. But I'm just doing it kind of like how most people would do it, is just adding water from my water container and then just activating it manually like this. And you can see it gets very creamy and buttery the second my brush hits that palette. So let's get another one of these little blobs going. And this color is very, very saturated literally using just the tiniest amount and try to create a bit of a gradient here so you can see what the lighter values of this color look like. Um, I'm gonna try to pull some of this away so you can see how when you get to the lighter colorations in your wash, if you're doing a very pale wash, it's nearly like a pink, um, kind of like, like how scarlet tends to be, which is a little bit on the pinky, sometimes orangey, scale depending on the manufacturer and the exact pigments that are in the actual paint itself. So beautiful color, absolutely beautiful. It's not a fire engine red. It's a more complex red um, that I imagine would probably pair very well with a lot of other things. So again, coming back to florals, you could go with the red like this for costumes. So a beautiful red dress. Also kind of the red that you would find on poppy flowers. So a sophisticated but more natural colored red. Let's go ahead and label it Pyrrol Scarlet. Okay, so next up we have Permanent Alizarin Crimson. And this is one of my favorite colors. So it, this one is definitely gonna be a bit of a bluer red. And, um, you know, I wear, <laughs> I'm a lipstick aficionado, so I'm always tuned into like the perfect kind of reds. And I tend to prefer um, bluish reds. I just really love the richness that you get with a bluer red. So a red that has a slightly more purple or blue pigment added to it. And that gives it a more blood red kind of look. And you can see just how, how much this pigment disperses so evenly such an easy paint to work with because it's just moving around very, very smoothly on my surface. So um, that is Alizarin Crimson, and that is just beautiful. I mean, this is really a color I would just pick up off the palette and put on my face. So next up, I have Quinacridone Rose, and this is gonna be, I believe this is the only pink on this palette. So let's get this going, dip my brush in some water again, and pick up more of that paint. And this is very much like what I would expect from, from a quinacridone, but it has maybe hints of something like an opera rose in it. Obviously, I would imagine there's probably not the light fastness issue, issue that you get with um, a uh, opera rose, but yes, definitely a very pinky vibe that gets more hot pink as you darken the color. And if I Pull some of that pigment off, you can see that you get a really pretty petal pink going on here. Um, and let's just darken it here and see how, how dark we can go. So this is just delicious. I mean, this makes me think of French macarons at La Durée. <laughs> um, strawberry flavored ice cream, candy, bubble gum, just that, that whole world of deliciousness. <laughs> All right, and look at how pretty, I'm sorry, but look at how pretty my um, paper towel is looking with these very muted, pretty pastels. Sometimes I look at my paper towel and I just see a piece of art right here on that surface alone, and I just fall in love with it. 
Let's go ahead and add our little label, quinacridone rose. And again, I've noticed that for all of these paints in this set, we're not getting the typical granulation that you get from a lot of Daniel Smith's um, paints. We're seeing a lot of very, very smooth, very even dispersion of colors, especially in the transitions and the gradients. So when you're building gradients, you're getting some really beautiful um, effects. Okay, so next up, we are going to move into the blues. So I have ultramarine blue as my next color. And before I embark on this next color, I'm gonna go ahead and wash or clean out my water container to make sure that the warm colors going on here do not interact with the pigments and the colors that I'm gonna pull from this palette. So you can get a really nice, pure look at um, what all these colors are gonna look like. Okay, we're back. So next color, like I mentioned, is ultramarine blue. And I am very, very picky about my ultramarines. So, okay, we've got a nice consistency going and this is gonna be a very electric blue. And wow, right away, we can see just how vivid, um, just this really beautiful, oh my goodness. This is like the blue that I would see on a tropical bird, like a macaw. So those bright blue uh, birds that you see in Brazil or like in the Pixar movie Rio, like this is that, that kind of blue, which is just electric and gorgeous. Um, it's a color that I don't think I would use necessarily as is on a natural landscape because it is so primary. Um, but obviously mixed in the right environment, the right um, setting, the right you know combinations with other colors will do absolutely beautifully. And I um, use this a lot for things like costuming on my ballerinas, uh, ballerina paintings, or you know it also reminds me of the blue and white china on Chinese ceramics or Chinese pottery. So absolutely stunning color. And I'm not seeing, well, I'm seeing a little bit of granulation here, not a tremendous amount. And that could just be, you know, that it's behaving well on this particular paper, but I'm not seeing that huge amount of granulation that I sometimes see, specifically from ultramarines. So let's label this ultramarine blue and move on to the next blue in the lineup, which is cerulean blue chromium. Again, cerulean blues tend to be a little bit difficult and finicky and can sometimes get extremely granulated and sometimes be very difficult to build in terms of, you know, if you want to layer or just have a, a deeper version of this color. So let's get this going and activate my cerulean blue chromium. And I think that the name chromium might just designate that it is a more opaque and less transparent version than your typical cerulean blue, which tends to be extremely watery and transparent. Transparent, translucent, however you want to call it. Um, and this is typically a, a perfect blue for a sky, um, sky blue or a bluebird. Um, delicate blue like you would find um, on an Easter egg <laughs> or for spring colors. And definitely when you bring in more of the pigment, you can get a pretty decent build, which is not that typical of a cerulean blue in my experience for the brands that I've tried. Um, so right here, I'm just gonna work it in a little bit more, just trying to get that really pretty transition. And yeah, just a very nice all-purpose blue. Like I could see this being used on oceans, on very easily on landscapes because it is a little bit less electric than this ultramarine. So let's label that as cerulean blue chromium. We're gonna transition into our greens and this is gonna be a bluish green, which is phthalo blue green shade. So typically with phthalo blues, there's different versions of it. There's a phthalo blue blue shade and a green shade, depending on um, which um, side it skews more, if it skews more blue versus green. Sometimes they have a yellow shade too, but um, the one in this palette is the green shade. I'm expecting this to be on the turquoise -y end of things. So turquoise or teal, if you will. And wow, another beautiful and very electric and very saturated, rich color. Um, I took way too much pigment from the get-go, so I'm actually gonna have to rinse my brush out a couple of times. Wow, this is a very, very powerful 
paint. And I, I mean powerful by the, by the fact that you just need a very, very small amount to get a ton of color. And that's really what you're paying for with these professional grade paints is that, yes, they are expensive, but you really need such a small amount of them that they go a very, very long way. You, you get your money's worth and um, they tend to be so much easier to work with because they're milled very finely. And so the pigment disperses and mixes with other colors very, very easily. You don't have to, you know, take your brush and like try to keep working on it to, to get these beautiful blends. It kind of just does it on its own. So that's what you're paying for when you are um, splurging or investing on higher quality paints. Okay, let's label this phthalo blue green shade. And my handwriting is getting more and more <laughs> or looser and looser as I go along. Um, so bear with me. So next up, we're gonna go with cobalt turquoise. And this one from the pan looks like a somewhat Tiffany blue. So Tiffany, the, the jewelry brand and the kind of packaging that they're very famous for. And Tiffany owns that blue. I believe that they registered a copyright for their blue. And actually I, I was wrong. You know, the palette looks a lot more intense, but when you put this on paper, it actually becomes a really pretty shade of this kind of like an antique or an, or an aged jade um, or like a, a stone. Um, I mean, like a semi-precious or specific type of mineral or stone. So it's a very natural looking green, which is not what I was expecting. Um, and in its darker instances, we get more towards a teal with a, a grayish undertone to it, which is not too electric, which I tend to really like because they're much easier to work with than the very strong electric primary colors. So here we have cobalt turquoise. So next we have phthalo green blue shade. And this is gonna be a very primary green, I can already tell. And these are the greens that I tend not to work with quite as often as the rest because they tend to be a lot more difficult. And I, I actually used a color very similar to this, actually pretty much identical to this, for a painting that I did of the Wizard of Oz. And I used this color for Emerald City. You know, I, I find it very, really like fantastical, like not an actual color that you would find in nature, but a color you would find on a costume, on um, a fashion outfit, um, on a jewel, or in the case of The Wizard of Oz, on um, the towers and the buildings of Emerald City. I will say that it's probably gonna be a, a more difficult color to use on its own without mixing um, than some of these, others, these other colors. So using a color like this on a landscape, for example, will be much easier to blend in and to work with other colors and other greens than a color like this, which is a little bit more artificial. So let's, um, let's label that. So we've got phthalo green blue shade. Um, do I have room for one here? I might have room for a little one here. So I'm gonna put sap green up here because I get the feeling that this is gonna fill up really soon and I might have poorly planned this, but that's okay. <laughs> um, this is real life and I'm kind of doing it as I go. So I'm gonna stick sap green right there. Um, and it's, we've already transitioned to the second row in the palette. And I'm going to get this going. And sap green is the universal, what I would call um, green, oops, the green that you, you, you see most frequently on natural subjects. So um, if you're painting foliage, flower, well, not flowers, but um, leaves on flowers, hilly landscapes, or just about anything where you're gonna be painting botanical or, or vegetation of any kind. Sap green, like, as the name suggests actually, is you know the, the color that you'd find on natural, nature-derived subjects. So you can get from really dark colors right here, like, like you're seeing right here, which are nearly, nearly black, very, very dark, to extremely pale and nearly like a, like a pistachio color. Um, in the lighter instances of that color. So I'm gonna write sap green right here. And um, we can move on to the next color, which is perylene green. And this is going to be more of a, not a muddier, but an earthier green, which are again, greens that um, I really, sophisticated colors and greens that I really like. I put this up here and I'm going to put 
Caroline Green right here. So let's see what happens. And it's very grayish and kind of like a stone color. Really beautiful, really gorgeous color. So this color has a little bit of green to it, but it's a very gray, sophisticated, interesting color that would work well in so many scenarios. And you can use this for shadows. You could use this for natural subjects. You could use this for, I mean, I could even use this for hair. <laughs> if um, somebody or my subject had dark enough hair and so you're not using a brown, you're using a much more interesting and, and um, unexpected color for something like human hair, for example. Even though, you know, when you think about it, logically speaking, it'd be very strange to have green hair. But, um, you know, especially in this range, you know, you really, you know, if it's used well in the right circumstances, you can get some very, um, like I said, an unexpected and off the beaten path kind of results. So that is Paraline Green. And we are gonna do undersea green next. And undersea green is another one of my favorites. And I first discovered undersea green um, in my Jean Haynes paint collection, which was the entryway or the gateway drug <laughs> to my recent Daniel Smith obsession. And this color is very natural and has earthiness. It has depth to it. It uh, has a lot of visual interest to it. And it's sort of like a sap green mixed with um, like a sepia or, or like a more muddier, earthy tone to it. Another really beautiful color that you can use together with sap green, perylene green for natural landscapes. And look at how that paint just disperses and bleeds out and creates really even dispersion. I don't really have to do anything at all. <laughs> like it is on autopilot. I can get my brush to just smooth out a couple of things and it just, it's, it's going on its own. So undersea green is this one. Okay, so we have raw sienna next and raw sienna is gonna be more earthy and it, it might be a little bit like the quinacridone gold, but we'll see how much that varies. And it is kind of quinacridone goldy it just has less yellow to it. It's a browner color and when it fades, it, um, or you know, when you have a lighter, light, lighter values, when you, when you water it down, um, you get more of, a, more of a beige than a yellow. So as if you can see here, this is more yellow right here in the lighter colors and here it's slightly more like a sandy beige. Even though the darker values of it are quite reminiscent of the quinacridone gold. So raw, sienna, light. And then we're gonna step up to the next one, which is yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is a bit browner, a little bit more gold as well. So, you know, you're also seeing that it has kind of a almond color, especially here up top when you, when you get a stronger or more saturated coverage going on that it does get a little bit toastier and more of a caramel toffee. I'm obviously getting hungry. <laughs> I always get hungry when I get to my earth tones because these are the colors that you associate with a lot of baked goods, which I absolutely love. Even though right now my pregnant, you know, during my pregnancy, I have not had so much of a sweet tooth, which is comes to a surprise to a lot of people. I've been more of a salty fiend um, recently, uh, but hopefully that changes when the baby arrives because you know, I, I, I used to love sweets or I do love sweets. It's just, I'm in a period of transition right now. So this is yellow ochre. Next we have, how do you say this? <laughs> how do you say this? Guthite, go, go with, no, guthite, I would imagine. Um, in parentheses, brown ochre. And so I could see this as being a little bit more of a dusty or more neutral, less warm version of a yellow ochre. And yes, right away it's, more in the, I wouldn't go as far as to say cinnamon. We're still in the baked goods category, but we are looking at something that's less yellow for sure and skews more in the red, not fully red, but it has more warmth to it and less of that yellow. 
This reminds me of the fur of a chip, chipmunk? No, not a chipmunk, a squirrel. Like your typical North American common squirrel would have a color kind of like this. I'm trying to see if I see any outside of my deck and I don't. So I can't verify that for you right now, but um, from memory, it really does remind me of the coat of a squirrel. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna write Guthite because brown ochre is really, really long. And next we're gonna do Indian Red. I love Indian Red and this is the color of fall. It's the color of when the leaves change color in autumn. And it just brings back memories of Thanksgiving and cinnamon and all good things. And this is a very, very opaque actually, very permanent. Um, opaque, not so transparent version of this color, but definitely in that cinnamon, very deep and very sophisticated color family, which I love. And this is the color that I associate with um, the Renaissance. So when I think of Leonardo da Vinci and I think of um, Caravaggio, Botticelli, um, these are the colors that come to mind. So let us label this, which is Indian Red. Next we have Quinacridone Burnt Orange. So this is extremely warm and caramelly, like a caramel square. <laughs> what else does it remind me of? You guys, I love talking about color because it just brings back so many memories and um, I think it's such a deeply personal experience for everybody and you know, Colors to me bring back memories of people, places, sounds, foods, tastes, so many of those things. Um, so I just love finding these associations that I think other people can maybe relate to as well. So quinacridone burnt orange. So next up is burnt sienna, and this is sort of like a palette staple. This is something that I think pretty much any typical palette will have. So if this color was caramel, now we're getting into chocolate territory. So this is burnt sienna. And the next one we're gonna have is burnt umber. This is really gonna be like a chocolate truffle. Burnt umber is really what I would call the deep Godiva or hot chocolate kind of color. Beautiful colors in this range for skin tones, especially if like myself, you work with more diverse skin tones, going from paler skin tones to deeper, richer, golden, deeply pigmented, um, especially like this, just phenomenal. Just a gorgeous color um, and one that I will definitely be using on some beautiful black ballerinas. And I'm doing a technique here called pulling. And pulling is where you pull the pigment off the paper, which is, you know, kind of, you always expect to be able to put pigment down on paper, but a lot of people don't know that you could actually lift it up just as easily. And I have a video all about that technique and a lot of other uh, watercolor techniques. If you are interested in learning more and, um, you know, upping your game in terms of watercolor painting techniques. So this color is burnt umber. I've got two more colors, which are raw umber and Jane's gray. And raw umber is going to be an earthier or slightly grayer version of burnt umber. So um, if I was, you know, kind of making the connection here for skin tones, raw umber would be somebody with a deep skin tone, but with like a cooler undertone. Kind of like Rihanna, I believe has a cooler skin undertone versus let's say someone like Beyonce, for example, who has a warmer undertone. So either way though, both really beautiful. And if you were using this color in landscapes, this would be great for, um, you know, woodlands, the trunk of a tree, even architecture, beautiful architecture with stonework and these deep, rich colors. As you put in more pigment here, you can see just how deep you can get it. So this is raw umber. And I have one last little spot here that I was able to squeeze in there for Jane's Gray. And Jane's Gray is gonna be, I believe, a very similar gray to something like a Payne's Gray. So gray with a blue undertone, which is a very easy color to work with. And uh, I prefer to have colors, or grays in particular, that have blue undertones or blue 
a coloration to them because they are easier to work with in a, in a more natural setting. If you're doing something like landscapes again, or people, um, they just play well with other colors and will not deaden your painting and make your painting look lifeless if you're not careful with how you use it. So you can get really deep and, and dark here, like a, like a dark pebble to much paler um, on the bottom here that I'm getting and again, lifting off a little bit of that pigment because these, these um, paints from Daniel Smith in this set are so staining and so rich. You need so little of them that I, you know, I keep forgetting and I keep putting way too much on my brush and not realizing that I just need a very, very small amount to you know, really pack a punch in terms of how much pigment I'm getting on the paper. So um, right here, I'm just gonna label this Jane's Gray and we are done with our swatches. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and you wanna see others like it because it really helps me with being able to grow this channel and create more art videos, tutorials, and all this fun stuff for you, which I just love doing. So um, again, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.